Well, a very warm summertime welcome to all of you. I'm Daniel. I said on team here is a pleasure. Extend a warm welcome to you. If you're a guest with us today, uh, genuinely, we are thrilled that you're with us. Uh, you're catching us in the middle of a series entitled The Good Life. And what it is, a series going through Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We're calling it our summer exegetical series. Exegetical meaning we're going line by line through this incredible text that Jesus gives us there on the hillside overlooking the Sea of Galilee, known iconically as the Sermon on the Mount. So if you have your Bibles with you or a device with you, scroll or turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. It's towards the end of this fifth chapter in Matthew's Evangelion that we get into some really remarkable, compelling, and gritty texts. This is the text that is entitled, subtitled in your Bibles, Lust and Divorce. Lust and Divorce. And I know this to be true in an environment on a Sunday morning. When you hear of this being the title of the text for the weekend, you're like, okay, feign sickness, I gotta go. Okay, here's why so many have struggled in the realm of purity, leading to adultery, leading to divorce. And it is a dark time in our lives when we go through such an experience, a dark time in your life, if you have gone through such an experience, to where there's now innumerable, immeasurable hurts. There is unwanted failure, and we have unwelcome souvenirs of our own journeys into brokenness. Some of you today even have, metaphorically speaking, in your pocket a souvenir from your journey into dark places over the last five or ten years. And so as much as there is this sense of, oh my word, this was not the Sunday to go to Mountain Springs, it is the Sunday to be at Mountain Springs. Because I believe that God is calling his bride to be pure and without wrinkle and spotless and unashamed, not to where we, the people of God, continue to give the body of Christ another self-inflicted black eye because of our own poor choices. So today, lean in, because freedom is coming for you. Lean in today, because freedom is coming for you. I'm going to read the verses today, explain context for our message today, and then we'll jump into the content. Verse 27 there in Matthew 5, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members then your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. Verse 31. It's also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Okay, we have covered verses 31 and 32 in previous series, and so today I want to speak to you specifically within this broader pericope in the passage here in the Bible. I want to really focus our time in on those verses 27 through 30, realizing that I'm not going to give full service and justice to those other verses, but I'd encourage you, if you're in a situation or storyline in your life right now where you're like, I was really hoping to hear more about this those verses, pick up some of the series that are in the mobile app. The Vow series would be one example about marriage, remarriage, and divorce. And so as much as I'd like to, we are going to dive only though in those first few verses. But within those verses, I'm going to give us three stages of demise that we all go into in terms of our thought life, and then three steps into breakthrough and opportunity. Three stages or slides of us into decline and three steps that we can take into opportunity. But let's pray and then we'll dig into what is a very personal and applicable message this weekend. Lord, we pray uh, you would speak through your word. You have since uh, the inception of scripture and you will through the fulfillment of all of creation. You are a communicative God. You're a compassionate God. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name right now for Holy Spirit-inspired conviction, but I speak against self-condemnation today. And I pray, Lord, that there would be liberty and freedom in this house today to live lives of breakthrough, compassion, mission, purity, that we would be kingdom of God people. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
We're living in a day of identity, idolatry, and flesh or skin fixation. No matter whether it's the gym or the workplace or the community or even the church, we are all subjected to this idolatry of one's identity and also a fixation on one's flesh. Advertising now sells at the speed of sexual temptation. Our bookshelves and our bookstores are filled with the salacious and the perverted. Our popularized music on the radio that many of us would know the lyrics to of these songs celebrate infidelity and encourage us to do likewise. And we now live in a progressive age to where sexual satisfaction and casual experimentation would be considered a basic human right. And as if that's not enough, we now have sociologists and we have counselors espousing theories and notions of new normative narratives saying, oh, this is the way we ought to live. And when we consider all of this, you and I, and we're raising our kids and raising grandkids and we're doing life and we're trying to live good lives, we're almost faced with this question of, is it even possible to live a pure life nowadays? And if so, how? Well, it's in this quagmire of belief, this twisted, broken, dark place that Jesus speaks those words that we just read. But yet with all of that that we see that Jesus speaks to address what is this salacious and and overly centralized culture, the place that we find the greatest tension in the biblical text is where we find Jesus saying the antithetical statement, where in many ways he is addressing and fixing where Moses would have acquiesced. Moses would have acquiesced to a certain degree in the Mosaic law because of what was going on. Jesus says, I know you've heard that it was said, but I say. And there's this tension in the text where he says this antithetical statement there in verse 28. I say to you something new. Yes, I know what you've always heard about adultery, but verse 28, I'm telling you. And then his next statement is revelatory. I'm telling you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Clearly, there is a gender specificity here with this verse, meaning his and her heart. But yet, with all this being said, there is not one of us in this room, male or female, to where we would say, honestly, our thought life is 100% pure. And because of the nature of our fallen nature, we are subjected to this strain and this battle every day until we breathe our last. But what's happening here is that Jesus is addressing something that Moses has said. He is addressing something and essentially has this amendment where he speaks of this and he says this. There is something to be said about this covert secret domain pertaining to our intentions, not just the realm of known actions. And this is a massive statement that Jesus makes where he essentially says, by elevating sexual purity, he says it's not just about one's action in in known public, it's also one's private thoughts in their secret life that speaks about purity. And this was this massive surgical precision cut that occurred there for those that were aware of the Torah as the new people of God listening, saying this is how you ought to live. And Jesus would say the same thing to us today, and that is this. Don't dismiss your covert thought life believing you're fine and only pay attention to your overactive or actions of life. Because sexual purity pertains to both, his wife. Jesus cares as much about the seeds of sin in our lives, our private thoughts, as the weeds of sin in our lives, our actions. I just returned from a few weeks being gone, as much as our kids try to keep the grass cut and things. We have this little plot of dirt, uh, affectionately known as our vegetable plot, but we've only grown vegetables three times in 18 years, but it's our vegetable plot. And I'm just busy tilling the soil, and yet we never put seeds in the ground, but yet you don't have to, do you? So I came back from being gone for a couple of weeks, and I swear there was fat hen, a type of weed, and it was up to my hip. It is much easier to displace the seeds of the weeds prior to them germinating and breaking the surface by continually tilling the soil of your heart than having to come back and lean back and pull weeds that have grown to the gauge of your thumb to get them out of the ground and bring a whole lot of dirt with them. What a great visual for sin in our lives. When we overlook the seeds of sin and we're unwilling to till our hearts 
There will be a time to that which germinates in secret will be seen in public. And where nothing was present and we thought there was no problem because no one can see, there is a germination occurring in our hearts. So much so, Jesus says, if this is going on, you've already done it. Why? It's inevitable. This is his point. It's inevitable. And by, by really, by means of highlighting the gravity of the issue, he says in verse 29, <clears throat> if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Or if your right hand causes you to sin, sever it off, cut it, cut it off. You know, there have been some through the years that have taken those two verses literally. One was an early church father, Greek origin. He was origin. He took himself into a private place and castrated himself. Welcome to Mountain Springs. We're preparing you for lunch. <laughs> Took care of the problem, but he didn't. Even if he would have plucked out his right eye, he would have still had his mind's eye. And by doing all of this, in fact, it was so barbaric what he did, and I make light of it, but it's a severe situation, so much so the Council of Nicaea, which we now get the Nicene Creed, the Council of Nicaea was so aware of the self-harm, they outlawed the practice. When Jesus says, pluck out your right eye or cut off your right hand, he is not talking about self-harm, he's talking about this ruthless self-denial. He says, don't hold back. No halfway measures will work in this realm. You have got to be aware that in every way, a small area of a stronghold in your life can very quickly become a stranglehold of your life. And so much so, he speaks to this in a real clear way. We've got to close off our wandering eyes. We've got to pull back from that grasp. We've got to speak truth over the lies that we so quickly believe. Every day, why does this matter? Because every day, we're faced with various temptations, Exter external lust or internal temptation or lust. Internal being maybe fame or wealth or power. External being sex or overeating or overindulgence in alcohol. Or in some way, shape, or form, there are different types of situations that we are tempted by. And as much as today's passage, now track with me now, <clears throat> for as much as today's passage is about a male-female relationship, lust has many forms. Lust comes in many wrappings. It looks in different ways. And so much so, like the Capital One commercial, what's in your wallet? What's in your lust wallet? What is it that's your struggle? What is it, what is it that's your challenge? Because for as much as we all have those grapplings in our minds of our thought lives, and as much as they're different in terms of what it is that we might think about, truly we all go about it in very similar ways. So I'm going to give you three progressive slides into ultimate demise, but then because I want it to be positive, three steps into opportunity of breakthrough. So if you have your app open and you've downloaded the app that Sarah mentioned a moment or two ago, I'm going to give you six blanks to fill in. Now, let me tell you, that's twice the power of a Baptist message. Not three points, <clears throat> six points. Come on now, Holy Spirit is at work in this house today. Point number one, point number one, the first way that we slip into lust is that we begin to imagine we begin to imagine <clears throat> all sin, but especially sexual sin, begins with our imaginations. No sin has ever been committed that has not first been imagined. We imagine things, we think about them, but to be clear, <clears throat> observing something to where you are tempted is not sin. We will see things or people all the time that we look at them or we look at it and we go, man, I wish I had that. That is temptation and that in and of itself is not sin. Jesus was tempted, but was without sin. We can be tempted, but here's the principle. We need to observe where we are tempted, observe and dismiss, or we will observe and obsess. You dismiss or you obsess. You dismiss or you obsess. And that is what we need to do. Because something happens in our hearts to where evil introduces itself to us. And if we're not willing or unwilling or we delay, we hesitate dismissing it, something like a seed grows inside of our hearts. Something like this seed of temptation. And I realize I'm going to give you a lot of thoughts today, but I realize in this realm today, there are those that struggle with this in terms of reflection, and there are those that struggle with this in the terms of addiction. And I would say, be aware of where you're at in this journey 
Otherwise, you too will have a souvenir of your own brokenness from the journey you did not want to take. Be aware of your struggle. Be honest. Accept it. Admit to it. Jesus stands. So why is the imagination so bad? Jesus stands against wild imaginations with the wrong person. Why? Because he knows where it leads. Even his brother James writes this in James 1, 14, 15. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed or dragged away by his own desire. <clears throat> then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. The word there, let's geek out for a moment together. The word there in the Greek refers to bait, lure. It refers to a bait. In that, there is a hook that has been placed between or wrapped around this juicy worm or power bait or something, and it is dropped right in front of you. You are going about your life, your happy little merrily little swimming away. You're just doing your thing, and all of a sudden, you see something, and you go, I like that. And you swim over to it metaphorically, and it's not until you put your lips around that delicious power bait and cause the hook to pull and lodge within your lip that all of a sudden you can be dragged away. You can be reeled in. What James is saying here is this, that you can observe temptations. It's not until you go too close and where you lock in to where all of a sudden that is when your life takes on a whole different shape and form. Remember the principle, we observe and we dismiss or we observe and we obsess. And we've got to be so quick to dismiss. Why? Because we are not helpless victims in this process. The online recording of this message that I did on Wednesday, I cry in the message. And the reason I cry in the message is simply because I'm so moved emotionally because of so many stories. I can see faces now. I can recall conversations now with people through the last 22 years here at Mountain Springs that have destroyed their lives because they did not observe and dismiss. They observed and they obsessed. And it derailed their lives. I remember having a conversation with a person one time. And it was a guy, and he had a family, a beautiful family, a beautiful wife, beautiful three children. And he goes, there is no way I can resist this temptation. A, no one else has ever struggled like I have struggled. B, you have no idea it's impossible to leave a hotel room. And I go, you were locked in? <laughs> no. There was no door? Well, of course there was a door door. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation. Notice this, pay attention now. Parenthetically, in the Greek, I joke, this means hotel door. Read this. He will also provide a way of escape. It's called a door. Walk out of it. He goes, well, you don't understand. She was so beautiful. And I'll never forget what I said. I looked him in the eye and I said, and so is the smile of your daughter that you won't get to see very much now. Don't play around with sin. We've got to resist. Because if we hesitate, Scripture speaks about hesitation in terms of sin. And again, let me clarify. You might be here and you might be quick to dismiss this content because you have, quote, no issue with the other Sex. Maybe your lust is control or power or fame. God bless you if that's your desire. <laughs> Here's what it says about hesitation. Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. When you hesitate, when you're faced with temptation, you are giving, quote, provision for the flesh. Anytime you give provision for the flesh, you will do progressively fleshly things. You're opening a door for the enemy to come. But beyond imagination, if we don't apprehend our imaginative thoughts, we very quickly go to the second realm, and that is this. Our thoughts cause us to fixate. Our thoughts cause us to fixate. This is when it goes beyond the reflective to the addictive. And this is where obsession takes root and the addictions form. Actions are visualized and then decisions are made and actions are the consequence of imagined thoughts. We always act based upon our thoughts. It's easy to act, it's hard to think. It's easy to act, but it's hard to think. And eventually, the rut of wrong thinking will lead us to indeed act. As murder begins with anger, so adultery begins with lust. Remember this phrase, observe and dismiss. 
or you will observe and ultimately obsess. We've got to come to this place. Now, let me be real personal, lift up the hood of our lives for a moment and tinker with the engine, which is a dangerous thought if you know my mechanical ability. <laughs> Here is the thing. I don't know what's going on in your life. And you don't know all that's going on in my life. But what I know, do know to be true about your life and my life is that if either one of us are messing around with secret sin sexually or in any other realm, eventually it will come out and it will cost you more than you want to pay and it will leave you there longer than you ever intended to stay. Be aware of that. We should not flirt with sin. You need to cut it off. It says this in, to the Colossian letter. Paul writes this, Colossians 3, 5 through 7. Put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Here is the principle. If we date lust, we will marry shame. If we entertain death, we will die. He says, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. There is truly the wrath of God. Thanks be to God for the mercy and the love and the grace of God, but that does not negate the wrath of God. It's because of the wrath of God that we have the mercy of God. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. Biblical principle today is this. You need to dismiss before you obsess. And number two, you need to kill the earthly inside of you before it kills you. So here are the practical points. How do we live? and put to death the earthly inside of all of us. Number one, learn to love your lot in life. Now, let me explain that simple phrase. Learn to love your lot in life. Why? Because if you don't learn to love your lot in life, you'll lust after your not in life. You'll always be looking elsewhere. How do you learn to love your lot in life? Number one, it's the absolute primo suggestion. Reject every inclination to compare. Well, I'd be happy too if I was married to him. I'd be happy too if I was married to her and slept with her. I'd be happy too if my kids were like those kids. I'd be happy too if I earned X and not Y. I'd be happy too if I had a boat and not a junker out front. I'd be happy too if I had more zeros in my bank account. I'd be happy too, I'd be happy too. No, you wouldn't. Reject every inclination to compare. Comparison is the fastest way to undermine joy. Remember that. It's the fastest way. There are times, anytime I feel like I'm joyless, I immediately ask the question, where am I comparing myself to another? Not to God, but to another. When you compare yourself to God, you have this conviction and desire to grow to be like God. When you compare yourself to another, you self-condemn. When you compare yourself to God, you self-correct. It's very different. Almost none of this is in my notes this weekend. We're going to have to put this one online. I'm just saying. Learn to love your lots in life, otherwise you will lust after your knots. Pursue your kiddos. Pursue your spouse. Pursue your grandchildren. Don't embark upon the dangerous, unfulfilling, yet fatal game of comparison. Number two, and I'm going to have to explain this because you're going to think I've sold out to impurity. Let me read it to you and let me explain. Number two, think more about lust, not less. What? Think more about lust, not less. Don't just dream about lust. Really think about it. And think about the consequences. Don't just romanticize the opportunity. Think more about it. Think really hard about it. Do you really want to be uninvited to your daughter's wedding because of that? Do you really want to be told to leave the hospital when you show up because your grandchild's been born? Do you really want it? Do you really want it? No. We superficially imagine we don't intellectually engage in the process of thought. Think more about it. And the next time that you're tempted, and the next time I'm tempted, the next time we are tempted by some sort of alluring sin, let's ask the question of, am I willing to pay what this ultimately will cost me? Truly, if you date lust, you will marry shame. You might call her by some other name, but... She will be shamed. So we've got to think more about it, not less. We've got to develop a vision for our lives. We've got to develop a vision, be thoughtful, be impassioned in our prayer, 
Be really deeply rooted in our thoughts. Have a vision for what your kids will look like. When Juliet was born, I've told you this story so many times. God gave me this phrase of looped vision. And holding my daughter, Juliet, she was just born. She was 10 minutes old or thereabouts. I'm looking out over the rolling hills outside of Cambridgeshire, the city of Cambridge in England. I'm holding her. I'm looking up and I'm holding her. And I look out and all of a sudden I look at her face. and Oh my, every time I share this in public, I cry. And I saw her with a white gown on her wedding day. And I felt the Lord say, have a loop sense of vision and parent this this child in the way you want her to look on her wedding day. In every decision, in every way, have a loop sense of vision. Don't just see right now and go, our kids are six and seven, they're driving me freaking crazy. Rather go, I want to have a vision of what they will be like when they're 27. Because here's what I want to tell you, and here's how I got emotional in the video that goes online. 30 years from now or 20 years from now, when your own children are having their own children, they will thank you. They will thank you that you didn't flake out as a parent when they can come to you and go, thank you for holding the line with your own purity. Thank you so much for guarding the integrity of this family. Now, let me say this on the flip side of that, because there's not one of us in this room that has a perfect story. If you have a perfect story, you're arrogant and God opposes the proud. You don't have a perfect story. None of us do. The sooner you embrace that, the sooner you experience breakthrough. None of us have a perfect story. Wouldn't it be something as well, though, if you are facing the reality right now of brokenness in your life, that you made decisions today and tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and so on and so forth to start living a new life and that 20 years from now, your kids come to you and go, Dad, Mom, you remember that Sunday when you turned it off, when you switched it off, when you cut it off? Thank you. What hangs in the balance? It's better that you lose one of your members. And this isn't speaking about congregational members. It's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go to hell. Whatever it is right now, start thinking more about lust, not less. Number three, finally, confront every lie that there is no way back. Confront every lie that there is no way back. In Jesus, there is always a way back. In Jesus, there is always a way back. And how is it? It's the journey of repentance, genuine repentance. Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. God can transform every life where he is invited. He won't gate crash your party, but he will politely wait for you to open the door of opportunity. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And for some of us, behold, I stand at the door and I've been knocking for a long while. Open the door. Let's have dinner together. Well, I don't know about you, but these times that we get together are one of the highlights of my week. I'm so thankful for an online community where I get to engage with people in the chat, just like what you guys are doing right now. So I would encourage you, Engage with us this week for summer adventure. Join us in prayer. Pray over the kids. Pray over the leaders. Pray over the host sites as they get to experience God in bigger, better ways this summer. Well, guys, we'll see you back here next week as we get to join our community again and continue on our Good Life series.